What do people think of the church? An extension of our king's reign. Well, what, do, what do people in your world think of um, your country in heaven? One of the primary problems is they're automatically going to think of perhaps some Christian they know and draw their conclusion. Listen, if we're living in a manner worthy of the gospel, then we should be demonstrating to our world that the gospel has the power to change lives because they can see it is changing ours. God uses men and women like us to influence others. The gospel isn't just for intellectuals and professionals. The gospel isn't just for the wealthy and powerful. The gospel doesn't pay attention to things like race, education, upbringing, or social status. The call of the gospel is simple. It's for everyone. And God calls us to live it out before a watching world. The Apostle Paul lays out key principles of how you and I can live out the gospel in Philippians 1.27. And that's our theme today here on Wisdom for the Heart. Here's Stephen Davey with today's lesson. There is uh, this interesting Greek legend that I came across I enjoy reading. This was the tale or legend of a beautiful woman named Atlanta and her long line of hopeful suitors. Atlanta loved to run, loved to race. Legend had it she was the fastest runner in her Greek city-state. Her parents were insisting she choose one of these suitors. And so she decided that what she'd do is challenge them to a foot race with one condition. She would marry the man who won the foot race against her, but all those who lost would be put to death. That'll kibosh your dating life, I'm sure. But at any rate, some men actually stepped forward, accepted her challenge, convinced they could outrun her. And uh, one race commenced, then another and another. All these men lost, and all of them lost their lives. Then a rather brilliant young man uh, came along named Hippomenes. Hippomenes also accepted the challenge but before entering the foot race, he had a jeweler fashion three small apples made of solid gold. Before the race began, he tucked them inside his Nike running suit. <laughs> when the race began, Atlanta pulled ahead of him, somewhat easy. But he took from his pocket a golden apple and tossed it in front of her off the path. And the glitter of that exquisite jewelry caught her eye. And she stopped to pick it up. And when she did, whew, he sped pastor. Atlanta recovered and caught up. The race was halfway over, and she began to outdistance him once again. The legend says another golden apple rolled off the track just ahead of her, and again she was struck by the glitter of the gold, and she ran over to pick it up, allowing Hippomenes to sweep past her. The goal line was now in sight. Atlanta ran like she'd never run before, evidently wanting to remain single. As they neared the goal, she once again edged ahead, and one last time he threw, and she spotted the exquisite golden apple just off the track, and as she momentarily wavered between the gold and her goal, Hippomenes swept past her and won the race. Legend has it they were married and lived happily ever after. I seriously doubt that part, okay? <laughs> as with any of Aesop's fables, they all come with a moral to the story. More than likely, the moral of the story here is to never take your eyes off the goal, no matter what glitters, just off the path. The Philippians were running well. Their focus, the gospel of Christ and the glory of God. Paul is still concerned. He knows there are actually wolves running along the path as well, ready to take any stray, ready to pounce, ready to take advantage that they can against the flock of God's church. More than anything, Paul wants the church to stay focused on the main thing. In fact, as we go back in our study to chapter 1, 
Paul is going to deliver in these next few ver, uh, words a warning that they keep the main thing central. You've heard it before. The main thing in life is to keep the main thing the what? The main thing. And just what is that for the believer today? Well, if you're reading through Paul's letter, many would agree that by the time you arrive at this last paragraph, you've arrived at his main point, his main idea for the letter. Everything is hinged to these verses, and, and everything swings from this. Now, Paul is going to deliver to these runners in the faith the main thing, which should be their goal. Let's go back and pick it up at verse 25 and, and uh, go forward. And convinced of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. And now he gets to this point. Only, stop there for a moment, only, Linguists point out that this word, manas, would be like lifting your finger in warning. Uh, one thing. I want to stay with you, Paul says. I want to be alive so I can multiply fruit and magnify the Savior. But one thing. Keep this in mind. You could paraphrase it. Just one thing. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ just kind of summarizes everything. Everything fits underneath that. Everything is hinged to it. And he's going to go back to this over and over again. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy. Those are six English words to translate one Greek word. And it's a loaded word. In order to understand what the main thing was in Paul's mind, we'd better understand the emphasis of this this one verb. The word Paul uses here is the verb from palatuomai, from which we get our word politics. Let your politics be worthy of the gospel. Palace was the Greek word for the city. Their city was a palace. That noun formed the word for political, political allegiances, citizenship. Paul is effectively saying, live in your city as a worthy citizen of the gospel of Christ. Now, this obviously meant, this one word, a lot more to these original hearers than it would automatically mean to us because we're limited by, by English. Paul obviously didn't have to go into an elaborate explanation on what it meant to be a citizen of their city-state as citizens belonging to their city. They got it. Just to refresh so that we can correctly apply this, remember, Philippi is a, is a Roman colony. It has been presented the prestigious, what they called, in quotes, the Italian right. They're in Rome, Italy. The emperor granted the Italian right to certain colonies, and with that came great prestige, wonderful rights and status. For one thing, they never had to pay taxes again. He would often take veteran soldiers who'd, who'd served with, with uh, a great distinction, and he'd, he'd uh, seed these colonies with these uh, men. Philippi is a Roman col colony with a, with a standing garrison, with retired uh, generals and, and, and so forth. And so uh, as a result, they had this great sense of nationalistic pride. You talk to a, a citizen of Philippi about, about the Roman emperor, and they would be quick to say something positive. Uh, you mention something to them about the Roman empire, and they would stand up tall. You mentioned the fact that they were all given what the rest of the empire clamored for, and that was a, a, a literal citizenship in the empire, and they would stand even taller. We know from history that these Roman colonies were called little Romes. No matter how far away, they were Rome in miniature. And, and they adopted everything about the empire. They adopted the the, the, the language, which was Latin. They would call their leaders, their magistrates, by Latin terms. They dressed in the Latin uh, toga. They spoke the Latin language. No matter how far away they were, they belonged to Rome. 
Now what this meant in practical terms was that these Philippian citizens would be, one, highly devoted in their occupation for the betterment of their city. Two, they would be careful not to discredit the polis, the city. They didn't want to bring disfavor on the city. Three, they would be loyal in their viewpoints, lining up with the empire. And four, they would want to live in such a way that they would be considered personally honorable citizens. Now, when you understand that kind of word, you can then understand a little uh, more clearly the connection. Paul is effectively saying to believers, be highly devoted in your occupation to the betterment of God's purposes on earth. Two, be careful not to, not to discredit the city of God. Three, be loyal in your viewpoints so that they line up with the word of the emperor. And four, live in such a way that we will all be considered honorable members, not only of this little colony here in this local church, but ultimately the empire with Christ our King that we've sung about today. Paul is effectively telling these believers to live as worthy citizens, not only in the city of Philippi, although by the way, good Christians ought to make the best citizens. But as citizens belonging to the city and people of God. In other words, and let, let me just talk a little bit about this. If the citizens of Philippi were automatically, as they were receiving this letter, they understood, so devoted to the honor of their human kingdom, how much more should we as believers be devoted to the church of our Lord today, which represents in miniature the reign of Christ. I mean, listen, if the average citizen of Philippi was so careful not to discredit his city and his emperor, imagine how seriously we should view anything that would discredit the church and weaken the credibility of the reputation of our emperor and his gospel. I mean, what kind of citizens are we for the sake of our city in heaven here on earth? What kind of reputation do we give our Savior? John MacArthur writes in his commentary on Philippians this, when the unsaved look at the church and they do not see holiness, purity, and virtue, there appears to be no reason to believe the gospel it proclaims. When pastors commit gross sins without consequences, when church members steal, cheat, gossip, or quarrel, when congregations seem to care little about sin and hypocrisy in their minds, the world is understandably repulsed by their claim to love and serve God, and the name of Christ is dishonored. It's a good quote. You see, Paul is appealing to the basic desire of every Philippian, which they had, which was to represent well his Roman citizenship. Why? Because whatever people thought of him or her, they thought of the empire. The reputation of the empire was no better than the reputation of any individual citizen. Now, don't misunderstand. Paul is not saying here that we need to live perfectly so that we can be worthy of salvation. Keep in mind he's writing to Christians here. We don't behave so that we can be worthy of going to heaven. None of us are. We behave as good citizens of heaven because we are going there and because we belong to it. Make sure that heaven has a good reputation on earth by the way we behave. That's what he's saying. Live in a manner worthy of your citizenship, ultimately, to the kingdom of heaven. I've traveled to many places in the world, have had the privilege of doing that, and will, Lord willing, do it again uh, this summer, traveling to Argentina to preach. And it's always interesting to me how other countries view Americans. You can feel it. In some places I've, I've been, I can tell they, it was awkward. Some places I have been, uh, there was anger. Other places are uh, grateful, depending on how they view the country from which I come. And they view me in the same way, and vice versa. 
I remember traveling to one particular country about 20 years ago, and, and I was walking through the marketplace with, with um, one of our global development teammates, and um, I noticed people just sort of looking at me. I was a lot taller than most of them. They just sort of stared. They knew I was a visitor, and they knew that I was more than likely an American. I asked my friend what they were thinking of me as an American, and he laughed and he said, well, <laughs> many of these people automatically think that since you're an American, you are sexually promiscuous and you're carrying a gun. <laughs> so they just kind of walked around me like that. How's that for a starting place in ministry? What do people think of the church? A, a, a colony of heaven, an extension of our king's reign. What do, what do people in your world think of um, your country in heaven? One of the primary problems is they're automatically going to think of perhaps some Christian they know and draw their conclusion. Listen, if we're living in a manner worthy of the gospel, then we should be demonstrating to our world that the gospel has the power to change lives because they can see it is changing ours. If they do not see the gospel changing our lives, our gospel is meaningless. It's just hot air. The truth is the world around us will only know the power of the gospel by what it, it sees the gospel doing in us. You may have heard it before, but the truth remains, and it's worth repeating. Your life may be the only Bible people around you will ever read. What are they reading? The classic little poem reads, You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds that you do and the words that you say. Men may read what you write, whether faithful or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? Paul writes, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, how do you do that in practical terms? Well, Paul is going to go on and deliver uh, three aspects of how to conduct ourselves as individuals and as a church in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. We have time for the first one today. Notice the middle part of verse 27. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear. By the way, Paul effectively holds up his finger and he says, Now listen, keep this one thing in mind and I'm probably going to hear about it later on. The local church and the reputation was spreading, by the way. Paul wrote to one believing assembly, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all around the world, Romans 1.8. Tragically, he wrote to the Corinthian church, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, 1 Corinthians 5.1. He also warned the Galatian church that he had heard they were so quickly deserting the one who called them by the grace of Christ, Galatians 1.6. To the Thessalonians, he wrote this, Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. Now that's the reputation to have. Word was getting around. Paul knew. This isn't a threat. Don't think of it that way. In fact, Paul is going to say later on in the letter that he is expecting to hear good news that will bring him joy. But this is what Paul wants to hear about this church. In fact, our church. Let me put it to you this way. This one principled point here is all we'll cover today. Paul is saying, I want to hear that your conduct is committed to repairing a disunifying spirit. I want to hear that your conduct is committed to repairing a disunifying spirit. Notice that I may hear that you are standing firm, it's going to take effort and commitment daily, in one spirit. Probably some parallel thought here as Paul refers to this common spirit, common ambition, common purpose. And a little later on, notice the next phrase, he talks about one mind. 
the key point is that there is oneness, that there is unity in the church. And that's going to be hard work. In fact, you've experienced perhaps the same in your own family. It's hard work, right? I mean, even deciding where you're going to go eat. You might have three or four opinions. And the more people involved, the harder it is. Is it any wonder that Paul holds up his finger and says to a church, we're not sure how large it was, but it had probably reached that point of 100, 150, or 200 where he said, look, you're going to have to work really hard. You're going to have to stand firm in one spirit. Now, what Paul does here to help us understand even better, to drive home his point, is as he often does, he paints a word picture. Uh, the verb here in the text for standing firm is a military metaphor. Uh, it, it pictures the Philippian believers in the local church serving in the same army. Now, they would understand the way that they worked as a unit. We don't necessarily, so let me explain. Uh, the Roman foot soldier never fought alone. There wasn't some heroic solo sword fight. That's in the movies, most of them. They fought in, in, uh, in a phalanx. They, they, they fought together in units eight rows deep. On voice commands or trumpet sounds, they could move forward, and they would move forward as a unit. They could move sideways. They could move backward. They even retreated as a body. It was an incredible thing uh, uh, to see during the Roman Empire. In fact, this made them so undefeatable for so many years. Now, the key was to stay in formation, to strive together, to stand firm in one spirit. In fact, one author will point out that uh, defeat could result if even one soldier broke ranks and allowed the enemy to pour in. See, their strength was their unity. Unity provided their strength. By the way, it's a little wonder then that the enemy for the last 2,000 years has had one primary goal, and it is to divide and what? Conquer. Someone breaks rank, and they're easy to pick off. No wonder Paul, by the way, throughout this letter, comes to this point in verse 27, and he's going to come back to it time and time and time again. Just as you as a family of three or four, two or three or four or five or ten have to stand firm, you, you've got to constantly be repairing anything that would disunite you. So also in the church. Strength comes in the unity of the body. I came across a, an Ethiopian proverb in my study that said it this way, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. I think of the lion that's roaming about seeking someone some church, some individual believer to discredit. Here's the main thing. Live up to your citizenship in Christ and live out the gospel. How? Well, here's the first way. In a way, think of it this way. Become a part of the bundle. And while you're at it and while you're in it, continually repair anything that would disunify it. Let me give you, very quickly, eight ways to make that happen. I'm going to say these faster than you can write them down, but here are eight ways. Assume personal responsibility for your spiritual growth and the unity of the body. It's your responsibility. Number two, participate in the services of the Lord's Day on a regular basis. For us, that's morning and evening. Number three... Join in the family life of the church through a smaller group context. It might be an adult Bible fellowship or a, a weekday Bible study. 
Number four, exercise your spiritual gifts and talents in specific areas of involvement for the sake of the body. Number five, support the variety of ministries through prayer. Number six, contribute financially to the church in a consistent, generous manner. Number seven, tell others about your relationship with Jesus Christ and support others who do the same. And number eight, respond positively to those in leadership. Now, by the way, what I, what I just read is a list that we have been encouraging over these 28 years. But I actually read you from a list that comes from another church. First Evangelical Free Church of Fullerton, California. These were eight ways that they developed unity under the leadership of their pastor teacher, Chuck Swindoll, as they served together for 23 years. The truth is these, these principles work in California and they work in Cary, too. There are ways to reveal we are standing firm in one spirit. No matter what, now Paul's raising his finger here in warning. He's emphasizing no matter what the world, the flesh, the devil, ourselves, might throw onto the path, just off the path, to discourage, discredit, deceive, distract disunify, no matter how glitters, no matter how interesting, no matter how inviting, make sure we allow nothing to distract us from the goal ahead and the gospel and the glory of God. That was Stephen Davey, and this is Wisdom for the Heart. Today's message is called, The Main Thing. Paul's message to the Philippians is clear. Keep your focus on Christ. Make sure that no matter what distractions come your way, you stay committed to the goal ahead, glorifying God through your life. I want to remind you that if you'd like to go deeper into your study of Philippians, Stephen has a book that can help you. In it, he goes verse by verse through this entire letter. Right now, that resource is available at a deeply discounted rate, and I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. You'll find Stephen's book called Philippians in our online store at wisdomonline.org. We can also help you personally if you call us today at 866-48-BIBLE. The number again is 866-48-BIBLE or 866-482-4253. Ask how you can get a copy of Stephen's book, Philippians. Join us next time on Wisdom for the Heart.